All right, it's time for our next panel. We're going to be talking about what can Georgia do to take control of its health care situation. And, you know, when if we're going to be spending billions of dollars of, of federal money, which is what we're talking about, bringing down some of those federal funds to Georgia to address some of these issues, we want to solve big problems. So I'm going to give you a very, very high-level overview before we turn things over to our panelists. So, you know, what are those high-level problems, you know, the, pr the things that some other solutions to health care really left unaddressed. You left people without access to primary care, which we heard in our previous panel how important that is. Leaves our hospitals with, you know, payments that don't re meet costs. You know, those are problems. If we're going to spend all this money, we need to have a way to, to address these big problems. One of those are unfunded mandates. So if you recall, there's a guy named Newt Gingrich. <coughs> back in 1994 that was elected Speaker of the House based on the contract with America. And one of the things that they promised would be is that Congress would stop imposing these unfunded mandates on state and local governments. That bill actually passed. President Clinton signed it. Unfortunately, it only applied to mandates going forward. There still is a huge mandate it was passed in 1986 called EMTALA, which is the law that requires all of our hospitals to see patients regardless of their ability to pay. That is still alive and well. It's the biggest unfunded mandate in our country. This is what it means in Georgia, billion dollars. We know that because the Georgia Hospital Association collects that information. This is their indigent charity and free care. Those people that can't afford to pay the bills, they go to the emergency rooms. It's the only place they can find. And guess who pays for it? We all do. This is a chart from the Georgia Hospital Association. And it might be hard to read. It shows you Medicare, they get about 96 cents on the dollar. Medicaid, about 86 cents on the dollar. They lose a huge amount of money on the uninsured. And that whole gray area are those cumulative losses of a billion dollars. And guess who pays for it? That arrow, the blue, is you and, you and I, people that have private insurance. Hopefully, most of us do. We're paying at least 40% higher prices than we need to to make up for the rest of it. It's also taxes. Many local governments have taxes that, are, that go directly to their hospitals to subsidize them. We can fix that problem. It's one of the things we're going to talk about. Another area is, is insurance. Using the insurance system to do things it wasn't meant to do. Insurance is great. You know, what, most of us probably can't afford to repair our house from scratch and rebuild if it gets hit by a tornado. But thanks to insurance, we can all pay a little bit of money, and it, whoever is the unlucky person that loses their house can have it rebuilt. But when you start applying insurance to what it wasn't designed to do, you start trying to pay for little things like primary care, which Dr. Hill's going to talk about, it just raises the price. If you try to subsidize those who are sick, with the insurance system. They didn't have insurance before they got sick. It causes a lot of problems. So here's a quote, this is a long quote, but the idea is why are we using the insurance system for the working class and the exchanges? We've almost doubled their premiums. In, in Georgia they have more than doubled to pay for people who are sick, those people with pre-existing conditions. Why can't we just pay with a broader base of using taxes? So who do you think this was? This was Bernie Sanders? No. Senator Ted Cruz. So that shows you and that conservatives can have solutions. They can support the tax increases where they're appropriate, where we need to spread things across a broader base. They can support funding these unfunded mandates. So that gives us an opportunity. I think conservatives have not been very good on health care. We failed on the federal level because it's a complicated subject. But we have the choice and the opportunity now because of the Affordable Care Act has this opportunity for the state innovation waivers that give us a great opportunity to actually solve problems. You heard in our previous panel, uh, and I think we've got a little bit of a high bar because after hearing them, I think the solution might just be turn it over to women. <laughs> it always has been. <laughs> but uh, they showed you that they're operating and they're actually on the ground making things work. <laughs> investing in primary care and solving some of these options, but some of the problems have to be solved by government. I want Georgia to be a leader in that, and that's what we're going to really focus on. So our first speaker 
Dr. Brian Hill, he's been here before. You've seen him as a moderator and a presenter. Uh, he's a urologist here in, in Atlanta. He is, is an author. He's been very active in, in healthcare policy and working with docs for patient care. Uh, incredibly articulate, but he, he has now put his money where his mouth is. He's been talking about direct primary care and, and other innovative reforms for many years. He's actually, with some partners, started a business that's actually offering those services. So I thought it'd be very important, particularly in light of our previous panel, to have him talk about how healthcare isn't necessarily as expensive as you think it might be. Brian? Yeah. I'm going to drive your film people crazy because I'm going to move. I can't stay in one spot very long. Uh, first, uh, and I want to tell the employer group, you know, we're coming. You know, the physicians are coming. It's been a long time coming. And, and maybe we need to apologize that, that we haven't been at the table and, and working with you all to actually bring that solution forward, but we're here. Uh, so I, I always talk about and want to talk about we're separating healthcare a little bit. Uh, we talk about healthcare and unfortunately mix a couple of different problems within that health insurance and healthcare. And those two have been brought together under one semantic of they're one and the same thing. They're not. You know, we need, we've got health insurance and we have health care. Health insurance is the way you pay for health care. Health care is actually when you see your doctor and you get taken care of in your doctor space. So what does that look like for health care and health insurance? So I want to get one, two, three. Why don't you all stand up if you could? I think you all stand up. One, two, three, four, five. When you all stand up. And I need two more. All right, I got, I got, I got stand up. I'll get one more st standing up there. That's it. There we go. So these people, we got 10 people that are out here for every practicing physician that do nothing to actually help take care of your health and your wellness. They're intermediaries, they're bureaucrats, they're administrators, there are people that try to help me get paid from my office or the insurance industry. And this is about $600,000 per physician. $600,000 per physician that do nothing to help take care of your employees, to help make anybody healthy and make them well. This needs to go away. Look around, this is being paid for through premiums. This is paid for through taxation. This needs to stop. So what we do, and what we're needing to do in our society, if we really want to radically transform and innovate in healthcare, is get rid of this. So you all can sit back down, thank you. That needs to go away. So why are we spending so much money on things that don't make our patients better? And what does that do? I'll walk over here. So, so what is that actually having all those people do in healthcare? So from a physician side of things, I have to have a lot of people in my office that distract me from my patient. I actually ask most of you all, when you call your doctor up and, and ask to go see your doctor, what's the very first question your doctor asks you? What's your health insurance? Not what's wrong with you, not how can I help you, but what's your health insurance? Does that not tell you that we're already distracted? Doesn't it tell you that we're looking in the wrong way? Shouldn't that be an indication that perhaps there's something a little wrong in how this system is set up? if that's the very first thing that crosses our mind. And then you show up at your doctor's office and you sit in the waiting room for a while, right, filling out paperwork over and over again. And then the first thing they ask again when you walk into the office is, can I have your insurance <coughs> card? There's something wrong with that. And so what that does is it fills a physician's office with a bunch of back office and a bunch of costs that have nothing to do with taking care of patients. It doesn't allow us to do some of the care coordination that needs to be done. It doesn't allow us to do some of the pharmacy work that needs to be done to allow us to interact with our pharmacists. It creates an electronic health record system in our offices they're all based around coding and billing to meet the needs of the, of, of the regulatory burden of the insurance industry, and God forbid that additional burden that comes from the federal bureaucracy that tells us what is actually quality care. So all of that is distracting us and not allowing us to do two things, provide low-cost care and actually provide the level of care that, that we could actually provide if we had physicians focusing on patients, if we had an office focused on patients. So it makes me cringe when I hear businesses going, I've got to hire a care coordinator. Why is your doctor not doing that? I've got to hire a pharmacy benefit manager. Why is your doctor not doing that? I've got to hire a teledoc for my, my employees that I pay $2.60. And I hate to tell you guys, but teledoc is a physician sitting behind a table with their pajamas on with a coat over the top of them and a stethoscope around their neck. And they're going to dispense medications to your individual patients because that's what people expect when they call teledoc. It's not care. You know, we talked about the mental aspect of people when you're obese and you're diabetic and you're hypertensive. And, and perhaps you're obese and diabetic and hypertensive because you're depressed, but God forbid you tell to your doctor and the doctor's got about seven minutes and they're looking at their watch and they're going, sorry, I got about seven minutes, but you know what? I'll bump up your antihypertensive a little bit and I'll add a little insulin to your glucose I mean, to, to fight your, your elevated sugar. But I'm not going to make you better. Oh yeah, by the way, go out and get a little bit healthier, will you, next time? And, and guess what happens when they come back? They're a little less healthy, right? They put on a little bit more weight. You don't solve the problem. It's not that care 
continuum that's being managed in your physician's office. And that's because they're distracted. So get rid of the distraction. Get rid of it out of the practice of medicine. We can talk about how we pay for. We can talk about the pay for. That's insurance. That's what, what you all do when you pay for it. Right? But let's not have insurance drive up the cost of care and make health care worse. Don't make health care distracted. So we say, let's take insurance over here and create a pay for model. And let's make this remarkable health care product here. And we do this by doing a couple different things. It's all direct pay care modeling. So it's not a plus, because we can talk about how we can make insurance work with what we're doing in healthcare. It's a synergistic product between the two, but I just don't want insurance to mess with my healthcare. So my healthcare is based around a simple model. Primary care doctor that knows you, right? It's the foundation. You all talked about the foundational aspect of primary care. Well, if you get all that stuff out of that physician's office, you make that physician's office focus individually on the patient. I get rid of my $60,000 person that does my coding and billing. I get my person that does prior authorizations and pre-certifications, and I get them out of the office. I get my claims denial person out of the office. I get all that out of the office. Now my physician's office becomes very inexpensive, and I can start replacing those people with health and wellness coaches. If I need a dietitian, I can be participating in that office. I'm in the inner city. Healthcare is local. You know, if, I, if I'm in the inner city and I need a substance abuse counselor instead of a health and wellness coach, I can make my health care local and fit the needs of my local community. So create a membership-based model for primary care, a per member per month for primary care, limited patient panel, and guess what happens to the health care space? Cost goes down drastically. The average physician's office runs a 72% overhead cost. Most of that doesn't help the patient one bit. So all that goes out, we create a membership-based model for primary care, limited patient panel, for that primary care space, and you get surprised how cheap we could actually do that when we make healthcare efficient. And then, like I said, we put health and wellness coaches and people in that office that actually focus on the patient. We have, we're talking about the, the pharmacists, my physicians have the cell phone of their pharmacists. They interact with each other, their teammates working together. It's a focused ecosystem on making people well. So, limited patient panel in that space. Now, again, it's healthcare, right? Healthcare is expensive because healthcare touches everything, and primary care is just not it, right? There's, there's direct pay care out there right now, there's on site, near site clinics that you all can do right now, but it's an ecosystem. There's more to that than just the primary care space. So there's labs, there's imaging, there's pharmaceuticals, and while some large corporations can go, hey, I can go out and I can leverage myself to contract against imaging to get low cost imaging, well, how about if you didn't have to actually go out and try to leverage yourself against imaging and, and actually create direct cash-based contracting for imaging and had a network of imaging that was purely based on cash-based contracting? You get rid of all the legacy costs in imaging and it drops the price drastically. I can get a CT scan for $295. You might be able to do better than that because you might have more leverage than me at, at Mohawk. But we can drop the price of imaging. Why are we paying $1,200 for a CT scan? I just had a patient I saw the other day. I'm a urologist, so most of you want to try to avoid me as much as possible. Uh, but I'm helpful when you need me. But I saw a patient the other day that was, was paying $31 for a medicine called Flomax, Tamsulosin, one of the most common medicine guys take. And he thought he was getting a pretty good deal because he changed his insurance and it went up to $81. Flomax is 14 cents a pill. Why are we paying $31 for something that's 14 cents a pill? Because there's no price transparency or price awareness. We create that by creating cash-based contracting and having patients be completely aware of the price of the product they're buying. Now we also create competition in the marketplace, which is a wonderful thing, isn't it? So imaging, same space, like I said. And then the big thing out here, right, is the my space. I'm a specialist. There's too many of me. I said we need more primary care doctors. It's just turned upside down because, well, we have primary care doctors seeing 3,000 people and they can't keep up and they're miserable. So why would you go into primary care? We need to change the model so they can actually take care of fewer people and do it better. But specialists are going, you know what? I have a tremendous overhead cost in my place. You know, my ambulatory surgery center's guy, I got a tremendous overhead cost in my place. If you find a way to pay me cash at the point of service, I'll drop my price drastically. I can get a, a within our product, I can get a, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy for $4,600. The Blue Cross Blue Shield rate is about $7,700. We can get a ureteroscopy for a stone for $2,500. That's usually about $4,700 to $5,700 in the marketplace. Why? Because if you pay cash at the point of service, whether it's direct contracting through an employer or whether it's through an insurance product that we can actually work with, we can actually drive the price of care down drastically. I don't have to spend money chasing money. I don't have 30, 60, 90 days out standing, you know, people trying to get that money to come back into me. So it's trying to align an outpatient healthcare ecosystem based on direct cash-based contracting, remove insurance out of it, and then we can always talk about, and this will be a whole other spiel, but we can always talk about what are some insurance products that are out here that are unique and innovative going, yes, I can match myself up with an innovative healthcare product 
to make sure I don't drive up your cost. I don't want to inhibit you. I don't want to mess with you, but I can certainly find a way to make sure that I'm helping decrease the cost of care when people do touch this healthcare product, because it still costs a lot of money. $2,500 to get a stone out of somebody still is pretty expensive. But we can still find a way to actually offset those costs. And, and so that's a, a, a part B discussion. But part A is, think for a second, and especially, like I said, legislators and things that are coming down the pipeline, we can take a pay for over here. But let us create a low-cost, high-quality, readily accessible healthcare system that's innovative. And we won't even talk about our IT system that we can actually develop now that's based around the patient and not actually the system, which is another talk along the way. But being said, we've got a lot of things that are out here, and there are physicians, like I said, we're coming. We're trying to get there for you all, the employers in our state. Um, and we are here with you as well to try to make everybody healthy because ultimately that's the end game and that's why people went into medicine is because we wanted to take care of people and make them well. We didn't go into medicine to take care of the system, which is where we're doing right now. So thank you. I look forward to asking your questions. That's probably a little more than 10 minutes, Kelly. Sorry, man. We have Russ Childers. And I've known Russ for over a decade because Georgia is one of the states, most of the states prior to the ACA had some form of a high risk pool to try to, to, to stabilize the individual and small group market for people with pre-existing conditions. Georgia did not, still does not. They actually passed the bill but never funded it. And I've been working with Russ to try to get that done in Georgia unsuccessfully for many years. Russ was uh, president of both the Georgia Association of Health Underwriters and the National Association of Health Underwriters, so, and he's been an insurance agent for many, many years, so he really understands insurance, which can be a very complicated, complex topic. I asked him to come talk to us about you know, living in rural Georgia, what's it look like in rural Georgia now from a health care perspective, and what can we do um, in the insurance market to improve things? Russ? Thanks, Kelly. I promise one thing, I'm going to talk a lot slower. <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say um, I think the primary care model is a great model. Uh, there are insurance companies with small groups that will work with a direct care, primary care model and offer rather substantial discounts uh, to their product if the employer pays for direct primary care or the employer and the employee pay for it. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, in fact, I've got several friends that are direct primary care physicians and say that they, um, they do about two thirds of their medicine over the telephone now. That's correct. Rather than in person because they know what their symptoms are. They call their doctor, they tell them their symptoms. Most of the time it's something fairly simple that can be solved uh, with one visit or a prescription or something like that. Um, or perhaps stop doing that, you know. <laughs> um, the, um, but the market in Georgia, and here we're talking primarily about the individual health insurance market. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a big market, but in Georgia it is a big market because over the last 10 or 12 years, a lot of small businesses have stopped providing insurance for their employees. And by small businesses, I would say we're talking about companies with 35 to 50 employees and smaller. So those people, uh, particularly those who are good stewards, I guess you'd say, of their money and try and protect their families against unforeseen happenings, uh, have tried to pay for individual insurance and because of that, has continued to go up, um, and particularly very recently, the, um, the bad news right now in all of Georgia, but particularly in rural Georgia, is in the individual market, there's very substantial market instability. Um, until about a month ago, a substantial part of Georgia wasn't sure that they would have an individual health insurance carrier in those parts of the state. Um, you would think that perhaps the President's announcement last night uh, might have changed that, but that had been uh, sort of, well, the folks in control guessed and guessed right and uh, took care of that um, about a month ago uh, through a, a second rate increase that the companies were allowed by Department of Insurance. Uh, that was criticized rather roundly in the 
uh, press, but um, the Department of Insurance understood that there was a likelihood this would happen and that it would create even worse market instability to um, ignore it. So insurance costs are way up. They've more than doubled since 2013 in the individual market in Georgia. Um, claims have to be up. Um, to some extent, that does and doesn't make sense. Um, the, the plans that have been offered through um, ACA, um, poor people have better access to those plans. Um, the big problem is that perhaps people that were paying for plans earlier that don't get subsidies have now been priced out of the market. Uh, so you've got them, instead of the very poor people not having access to coverage that's affordable, the middle class doesn't have access to coverage that's affordable, uh, and people that are well off are beginning to wonder whether they're better off uh, not buying insurance and just paying the bills. Um, the, before last night, my next comment was going to be that um, the unsure nature of the cost sharing reductions was sort of the last straw uh, that we had built, that there's built into the rates in Georgia right now an increase that was somewhere in the 30 to 50 percent range that were to take the place of the money coming from the federal government for cost sharing reduction. And just to briefly explain that, it's written into the law that the insurance carriers will reduce deductibles, co-insurance, and co-pays and out-of-pocket maximums for people below a certain income level. They have to do that under the law. What the president did was he took back the money that technically the Supreme Court had decided several months ago hadn't been approved by Congress. He took back that money um, that was helping them provide those cost sharing reductions. So what does that do? It increases rates 50%. Uh, what it does for the people that are receiving subsidies and cost sharing reductions is nothing. Because the premium they pay is based on what they pay, not on a, 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 a reduction that the federal government helps them with. So if their premium was $100 and they were paying 20, now it's $200, they're still paying $20. The federal government just took the money from cost sharing reductions and moved it over to premium subsidies. Um, the, I, I was also going to say last night that if that didn't happen and the insurance companies were reassured that cost sharing reduction reimbursement would carry forward into the next year, that we may not have that 50% increase. But that's not going to happen anymore. So what happens? The people that are paying premiums for insurance coverage are going to pay a lot more premiums for uh, insurance coverage. Um, the, there are several other things that are cre creating this instability. Um, 1332 waivers have been mentioned, the, the waivers that states can obtain for uh, trying to work with um, uh, the insurance market in their states. My understanding is that in a couple of solidly Republican states, they've been denied recently. Uh, my information says Iowa and Utah were denied waivers. You'd think with Chuck Grassley in Idaho and, and uh, Orrin Hatch in, in Utah, they would have had some influence on that, but perhaps no. Uh, the current market in Georgia right now um, was roiled about three months ago when Blue Cross Blue Shield announced it would pull out of the individual insurance market. Um, they were finally convinced by the Department of Insurance that uh, to stay in the 75 counties in Georgia that would not have had an insurance carrier as a result, um, the, um, the, carrier, the other carriers in the market are Alliant, which is a small carrier that's primarily been in northwest Georgia over the last few years, but now is going to cover pretty much all of the state north of Atlanta, outside the metro area. Um, so the mountains from uh, over around 85 back around um, to, to west of Atlanta, 
Heard County, I think it's one of the counties over there. Um, the um, Kaiser is still going to provide coverage in its coverage area, which is primarily in metro Atlanta, and a company called Ambetter, who has been in Georgia for many years as a managed Medicaid provider, uh, is going to pick up the regular individual insurance coverage in the rest of the state, which will primarily be southwest Georgia in the area between Macon and, and Atlanta, with some exceptions in East Georgia. Um, that market will have increases of 50% twice since the last rates people saw. So those people that are calling my office to find out how much their insurance is going to cost, we have to tell them we're not going to know till a week after next, the week before open enrollment, but it's going to be a lot more. And these are people that were scraping to afford coverage as it was last year. Uh, to a great extent, these are people that might have some health problems, perhaps not currently being actively treated, but uh, blood pressure problems that could lead to heart attacks um, or strokes or uh, cancers that may have gone away for now but might come back. Uh, other things like that, they're trying to maintain coverage because they're trying to be good citizens and they may not be able to do that. Um, that's not to say things were better before ACF. Um, I've been in the business 45 years. Um, before ACA, if you were poor or if you had a health problem, you were pretty much out of luck in Georgia and in a lot of other states. Uh, at least 14 and probably more like 16 to 20 states, if you had a health problem, you were out of luck because they didn't have a, we didn't have a high risk pool and neither did any of the other states. Um, the, um, so, and, and I should have qualified that, if you were poor but not poor enough to qualify for Medicaid uh, because you still had Medicaid as a backstop. Uh, the system was broken in many states. Uh, rates were two to three times our rates here in Georgia, which we felt like were high in New Jersey. Um, we would go to national meetings of insurance agents and sit at the table next to New Jersey and pick on them because their rates were so much higher than ours. Um, the, there was a high-risk pool failure in Kentucky. Uh, there was no carrier for a while, no carrier that would provide coverage in the state of Washington for a few months uh, until the Department of Insurance convinced a carrier to take coverage at a much higher rate. So in general, we've just traded old problems for new problems. And the reason is we're not paying attention to what the problem is. Uh, to some extent, it's the cost of health care. But I think the better way to look at it is, is it's what you were talking about in terms of cost of health care. It's more the cost of all the other stuff. Um, the, um, by the way, it, it, in talking to direct primary care physicians, one of the things that I found interesting was as I talked to them, they said, so I'm in medicine. I'm not in sales. Can you help me sell my direct primary care practice? Uh, so we're talking about that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, um, so we may not sell as much insurance, we may sell more direct primary care. So I've talked a long time now, so I'm going <laughs> to be quiet. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Um, now, to talk about all that other stuff and how we might be able to waive that is uh, Ray Hederman. Ray is Executive Vice President at our sister think tank in Ohio, the Buckeye Institute. They do a fantastic job. They've got a little more of a challenge up there in Ohio. Um, but uh, he is, was previously with the Heritage Foundation in Washington and is one of the most knowledgeable people I know in terms of healthcare, but specifically about the state innovation waivers that are available under the Affordable Care Act, also known as the 1332. If you want to impress your friends, just call it 1332 have insider knowledge, not to be confused with the 1115s. Um, so Ray is going to talk to us about you know, what is possible, what are other states doing, and then we can get into a conversation about you know, how can Georgia utilize this process, right? Thanks, Kelly. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I remember my dean telling me uh, when they were doing a presentation about you know, what you should study, 
And the dean of our graduate school said you should study healthcare. If you don't start studying it today, at some point in your career, you will be studying it, whether you're in politics or business. And uh, uh, I think those words are true. And quite honestly, I had a enjoyed uh, taunting my friend Jonathan Williams a few minutes ago and said, you know, I'm glad you tax guys had about three days uh, because health care is back in the news. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the president's actions yesterday. So my disclaimer is everything in my talk is accurate as far as I know till 7 a.m. Eastern time. Anything that has come out of Washington the last three hours, I simply uh, uh, have not uh, yet uh, read about or have been informed about uh, because health care is changing very quickly. And what I want to talk about is basically how states can think about working around some of the dysfunction in Washington. What the Affordable Care Act did was kind of take unprecedented control of uh, mainly the individual health care market from a lot of states. You know, it did a lot of big components, but the individual health market and the Medicaid expansion were two of the biggest impacts. But inside uh, the Affordable Care Act in Section 1332 is what was called state innovation waivers. And this would allow states to basically escape some of the re requirements in the Affordable Care Act that insurance was forced to offer if states did certain things subject to certain guide rails. And you know, I'm going to say that 1332s are not a silver bullet. It's not as good as going back and oh, Washington fixing it completely. But right now, it seems to be a good chance for a lot of innovative states to think about how to fix part of the markets that you know, we were discussing about. What is going on with the individual market? How can you help people that need to get care? How can you help people with Medicaid uh, that may not be getting adequately served? Those are possibilities that are now on the table in 1332s. And whether or not you know, a state chooses to pursue a 1332, let me tell you the actual practice of thinking through what your state can do is going to be invaluable. Because one commonality that came out of Washington for every health care bill was punting as much responsibility from DC back to the states. You know, I was working on another paper with a friend of, at, at Mercatus Institute, and we're saying you go through, whether it's the MacArthur Amendment from the House, aspects of the uh, Better Care Act from the Senate, you take a look at Graham Cassidy, they all involve some aspects of block granting responsibility to states to take care of individual markets. So you need to think through, how are you going to do it? You know, we believe in federalism, so you know, hope, I'm hoping that people in Georgia have a very different alternative uh, than the single-payer systems that you know, Vermont and California have been thinking through. But if you're not thinking about this now, then when this block of money comes, you're already going to be behind the eight ball. So there are four guide rails, uh, uh, four guard rails of state innovation waivers. So a state, a state has a lot of things they can do, but very quickly, you must cover a comparable number of residents. Coverage at least is comprehensive. Coverage must be at least as affordable. And you can't increase the federal deficit. So those are considered the four guardrails of, uh, of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, uh, what's interesting now is some of the guardrails have been greatly weakened as the ACA has taken effect. Uh, for example, the comparable number of residents, guardrail number one, uh, has been greatly weakened because we've seen a lot of people simply leaving the individual market. The individual market peaked in 2016. We've seen it declining even before President Trump uh, uh, was elected to office. And a lot of these people that are no longer purchasing insurance in the individual market are middle class people. The second thing is that the Obama administration issued federal guidance. And so guidance is basically how that administration is going to interpret these guide rails. And the Obama administration took a very, very restrictive approach on how it was going to do this. So for example, the word comparable. Comparable could mean a, a million people. It could mean 900,000. The Obama administration said comparable number of people is going to be a floor. It had to be a, a, above. Uh, they also basically went beyond that and said, it doesn't matter if you're covering more people. It depends on what type of people you're covering. So for example, elderly, low-income people were giving a higher priority status uh, under the Obama administration. And one of the quotes that basically said what the ACA guidance has done is that it basically empowers bureaucrats to retain the discretion to deny a waiver uh, that even meets the statutory guard rails. Uh, take a look again at, you know, the uh, will not increase the federal deficit. What the Obama administration did is said you have to do that in each and every year. Very different from what a state needs to do to make an 1115 waiver. And so as a consequence, you know, states have been a little gun shy about moving forward on this issue because this guidance is restrictive. The good news is it's simply guidance. That means it's basically it's just how that administration is going to interpret it. 
It didn't go through the full public comment period. It didn't go through the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, excuse me for getting a little wonky. So it means that it's very easy for the president to come through and change it. And we're starting to see some signals from the Trump administration that basically they're going to take a very different approach on 1332 waivers. So last March, then Secretary Price and Administrator Seema Verma wrote a letter to every governor highlighting what states could do under 1332s. The following month in May, they went forward and they issued a checklist of saying, here's exactly how a state can get a 1332 waiver approved. Here's every step you need to go through. And we've seen states responding. Now about 20 states have either started investigating 1332s, have current uh, 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 waivers in process, have submitted them, or have some approved. So very quickly, I showed you kind of what guardrails uh, uh, exist, but what can be waived. So this is a, a list, and a few of the things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, uh, essential health benefits requirement can be waived, as long as you're still meeting, going back, meeting that guardrail of, of comparative coverage. And so this is important because basically it would give a state the ability to, again, go back to some of its pre-existing insurance mandate requirements and be able to work with HHS to say, look, we think that our state, this is the needs of our population. We're going to define what makes an essential health benefit compared to the federal government. So it returns that authority to the states. Uh, we're also seeing that the idea right now, as you know, that uh, what Obamacare does is it takes a lot of metal tiers, you know, bronze, silver, gold plants. It says states can waive those, and we actually see a lot of states looking at that. Uh, states can basically go with a single risk pool. Uh, unfortunately, what provisions states can't waive are um, uh, some of the big things that have really driven up the price of insurance, you know, community risk pools, uh, pre-existing conditions, guaranteed rating. So, you know, it's a tool in the toolbox with a lot of rich possibilities that we're starting to see. So there's a current list of 1332 waivers, and I want to say that there's been a couple that were submitted and then withdrawn. Uh, the two I want to focus on is the, uh, for, for right now, is the Alaska and Minnesota reinsurance waivers. So, you know, we heard uh, Georgia talking about creating a high-risk pool. Uh, and so Alaska, in the summer of 2016, uh, when, uh, before the presidential election, Alaska saw that, quite frankly, its individual insurance market was in a death spiral. So they had the state legislature pass legislation to try to figure out a way to get federal funds to be able to create a new state higher risk pool to lower individual health insurance premiums. They submitted their 1332 waiver in December to President Obama, and it was approved by the Trump administration this summer. Uh, when that happened, you saw a whole lot of other states taking a look saying, this is a good idea. Uh, Minnesota followed suit, and then the last few months, you've seen a whole lot more uh, from Iowa, Oklahoma, all starting to submit reinsurance waivers. And again, the, uh, the Trump administration has published a guide saying how you can do this. And states have kind of done it uniquely, but the concept remains the same. Using some of the federal dollars coming through subsidies, pulling high-risk people out, trying to lower premiums for everybody in the individual market. And Alaska saying, look, it appears to be working. The approved premiums much lower because the reinsurance waiver. I said Oklahoma uh, was withdrawn because Oklahoma basically submitted an expedited waiver asking for HHS to uh, uh, approve their waiver in about three weeks. Um, apparently, Oklahoma doesn't understand how D.C. has ever worked, and uh, uh, they withdrew it last week in part because they wanted the waiver to affect this open enrollment period, uh, which is just uh, uh, pretty much impossible for anything to get through HHS. But Oklahoma, I think, has some really bold ideas because they basically formed a task force and said, look, we haven't expanded Medicaid, but let's take a look at how we can uh, address our health care. And they looked at it with five guiding principles. Increased state flexibility, decreased state costs, better innovation, better health outcomes, and greater choice in individual freedom. So they're very much taking a free market approach. So some of the things they've been looking at is getting rid of the subsidy structure. Because the subsidy structure right now is very much based on income. So what this means is, if you're a low-income person, you don't care as much if your premium is going up 90% because you're only paying, you know, 10 cents on the dollar. Where if you're a middle-class family who's not subsidies, you care a whole lot if your premium is going up 30, 40, 50%. So Oklahoma is saying, look, we know this is bad economics. Let's replace this with a flat credit based solely on age and a little bit on income, but it's a flat credit which encourages people to do better shopping 
instead of uh, 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 lower income people being completely insulated and not caring if uh, premiums are going up. Um, they also are looking at expanding health savings accounts, being able to create health savings accounts to encourage people to be able to buy insurance. Uh, they want to be able to repackage dollars from the federal government, and they're getting rid of basically the subsidy structure from 300% to 400% of the federal poverty level. So they're making uh, the benefit available to lower income people and trying to help higher income people by lowering premiums to the high risk pool health savings accounts. So that is something that Oklahoma is starting to really explore. They haven't fully submitted the waiver, but they issued that guidepost. They did their immediate uh, waiver, simply looking at reinsurance they just withdrew. But that's something saying, look, you know what? We can repackage these subsidies, offer a flat credit similar to the similar Senate health care plan, create health savings accounts, and that's a way they said we can start offering health care to people that could be in the gap population to start looking at Medicaid population. Let me talk about Iowa. So Iowa had their original waiver, basically. They submitted a, uh, uh, basically a cry to court, a cry of the heart in June, which is uh, uh, there's a whole bunch of technical documentation that has to accompany 1332 waivers, actuarial analysis, public comments. And in their first waiver, Iowa said, screw it. You know, they took President Trump's executive order that said, ameliorate all the harm from the Affordable Care Act. And that's what Iowa uh, put as their technical documentation. And then they were saying, you know, that's not really, really right. That's not really an actual analysis saying your people are hurting. But it shows that the Iowa market had been devastated. And so what Iowa did, and they said, you know what? We're going to follow, do a little bit what Oklahoma did, create a flat premium. But one of the things they did is said, we're not going to go from 0 to 300% of poverty. We're going to get a flat premium to everybody on the individual market. So even people above 400% of poverty would get this individual premium. And they said, we're only going to use money from the federal government. Uh, uh, so it'll be interesting to see how Iowa goes farther because they actually wrote in and said, if these cost sharing reductions are available, we're going to use that to lower premiums. O uh, uh, Oklahoma was doing the same thing. And now that that money is no longer available, you know, they're going to have to figure out a little bit more the source of funding. But Iowa said, we're only going to use federal funds to pay for the subsidy program. And so Iowa basically has been pushing the ball forward, saying, look, let's try to figure out a way to give a flat tax credit to help everybody in the individual market, something that I think uh, uh, my friends at Heritage, my former employer, have been talking about for a long time. You know, trying to equalize a little bit of the health care treatment from businesses uh, uh, that offer group coverage to the individual market. And then finally, you know, going back to the guardrail question, the other thing Iowa did, and their waiver's pending, is Iowa challenged the federal government. Iowa basically said uh, President Obama and then Secretary uh, Catherine Sebelius uh, broke the statutory law of uh, the Affordable Care Act by allowing grandmother plans, uh, basically allowing certain uh, special enrollment periods, an attempt to prop up the, prop, uh, uh, the political popularity, bring people in. So Iowa said, you know what? HHS has established a precedent of violating the statutory text that restricts what states can and cannot do. Therefore, let us operate a little bit outside those guardrails because clearly the precedent has been set. So I don't think that's a good thing for the rule of law, but it shows how big some of these states are thinking and where they're going. And then you're seeing the next step where Iowa is saying, you know what, we're not just looking at federal subsidies that are going to direct patients. Let's take a look at everybody who's dropped out of the individual market that could be eligible and ask for federal government to cover those people. And then you're starting to see some other states saying, you know what, can we combine Medicaid and money from 1332s to be able to help transition families off Medicaid, transition families off the gap population, and start working through those? So if you're going to, uh, uh, if you're a tea leaf uh, a watcher in healthcare, I think that the, the, the couple of things I'm looking for is uh, continued strong statements out of the administration on 1332s. Uh, we've, ho we've hoped and we've called for rescinding the Obama guidance. Um, also taking a look at how the administration continues to move forward on the new Iowa waiver that was just approved uh, last month. And so they said, yes, you have uh, 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 dotted all your I's, crossed all your T's. So has the administration negotiates with Iowa, I think will be very interesting. And then there are other uh, states right now that are continuing to accelerate. Uh, Massachusetts has announced plans that they're going to be submitting a waiver that will waive the individual mandate. So I think, you know, taking a look as more and more states move forward, you know, how you can sit there and take the best and say we like a little bit of Iowa, a little bit of Alaska, and a little bit of uh, Oklahoma moving forward. Thank you.
All right, that's a lot of information to process. So what does that mean for Georgia? How can we incorporate some of these ideas? And I, I think I've sort of put together some principles uh, going forward. I think first of all, with the reinsurance or the high risk pool, I think that's a no-brainer mm -hmm. that we need to stabilize the market. I looked at uh, last week, I looked at what would a family of four, I'm a family of four, what if I lived in Valdosta? What would my, be my premium for a silver plan next year? It's going to be about like $35,000 if you don't get subsidized. $35,000. Sound right? Yep. I mean, I, you can't afford that. So we are in a crisis situation. We've got to do something. So that's the first thing we should do. But we've got a whole group of people below the poverty level that don't have any access to, to care, really, I mean, any kind of insurance because we didn't expand Medicaid. And these individuals are not eligible for Medicaid for the most part. So what do we do for them? And, and one of the, the interesting things that this last six months of debate at the federal level have, has established, there's a lot more agreement on health care than you really think. I mean, elected officials, you know, they're over here and they make a lot of points when they're speaking to their base. But there's a lot of agreement. So that, that group below 100%. Both of the Senate plans, the BCRA and the Graham Cassidy, they would have provided subsidies for those individuals. They recognize that we're paying for them already in a very efficient way when they go to the emergency room. We can do better than that. Let's pay it up front. Whether it's refundable tax credit or a block grant, they both funded it. So then, what's the right amount? So with Medicaid expansion, the costs are running around $6,000 a person, a little bit higher in some, some areas. But it's a nine to one match, 90% federal money, as opposed to traditional Medicaid, which is a two to one match. So first of all, I don't think anyone thinks that that's sustainable financially, to continue to give a nine to one match for people that are able-bodied, relatively healthy individuals. And if you look at, if we went back to the two to one match, that's $6,000, that's $4,000 in federal money for these low-income individuals. Well, if you look at the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation numbers for the, the Senate bill, the BCRA bill, for the state of Georgia, you know what the average subsidy, the average tax credit was in the Republican plan? A little over $4,000. <coughs> Graham Cassidy was a little bit higher than that. So I think not only have we agreed that we need to, to help these individuals, but the amount of money is about the same. So. What does that mean for Georgia? Well, the principles, you gotta have your principles because it gets complicated. First of all, it needs to be, our plan needs to be based on a sustainable amount of money. You see Ohio, you know, they expanded Medicaid and now how hard it is, even if they think it's the right thing to do, pulling that back is almost impossible. So it needs to be sustainable. We need to invest and reinvest in primary care. You've heard it over and over again. That's where the money is best spent. We need to get rid of those unfunded mandates on our hospitals. That's why a lot of our rural hospitals, including the one in my hometown, have gone bankrupt. Uh, it, you know, if they're treating patients because they have to by federal law, they shouldn't be losing money. So we need to address that problem. We need to allow local solutions. Just like we don't like bureaucrats in Washington telling us how to spend our money in Georgia, the people in Valdosta and Columbus and Ludawisi don't want a bureaucrat in Atlanta telling them how to spend their money. So we need flexibility. And Finally, we need to put the individual in control. They always need to have options. Allow them to opt out. Allow them to see what competition does. So what would that look like? And this is something we worked on four years ago. Uh, and it's th some things have changed, uh, but this is sort of gives you an idea. For the people at the below the poverty level, we think there could be $2.6 billion in new money coming into Georgia. Well, that's a, I guess you call it a block grant. But, you know, government doesn't have to be the only source of money. What we've talked about is this aggregated payments. Because individuals ought to pay something, and they'll have a little skin in the game. There are, there are, law, there are laws in the books that pre prevent that from going over a certain percentage of income. But how about employers? Georgia State University did a survey in 2011 for small businesses, and they said, you don't offer insurance now, but you say you'd like to be able to, how much could you afford? And the average amount was $1,400. That's not too bad. It's pretty significant. Well, how about charities, churches that might be adopting families? They could put money in. How about your friends and family? 
I may be the ne'er-do-well cousin Kelly who's been in and out of alcohol treatment and, you know, ask Uncle Bob for some money. He's not going to give it to me. But if I, he could write that check directly for health insurance where maybe I can get some treatment for my illness, he might be willing to do that. So aggregate all that money together and let these individuals go out to the marketplace and buy insurance and let the leftover money go to a health savings account so they can enter it into a direct primary care relationship, pay for other expenses. But here's always the problem. Not everybody signs up, even if it's free. We offer Medicaid to lots of people in Georgia. We have children and other individuals that are eligible for Medicaid, yet they don't sign up. But they go to the emergency room when they're sick, and that money to pay for them stays in Washington. So the unique part of this plan is let's make sure if people don't sign up, we pull down that money into a pool that can help reimburse our hospitals. That's the default plan, is we're at least going to reimburse those hospitals for their costs. We can tell our hospitals, if you get one of these patients, you're not going to lose money on them anymore. That's going to solve a lot of problems. And then we're going to use extra money to go in and try to get them connected to a clinic, to a, a doctor, maybe whether it's direct primary care or some other way. There's plenty of money. Remember, the, the total cost of all these individuals right now is a billion dollars. We've got $2.6 billion to work with. And I'll tell you one other idea. One of these options under the insurance that they can choose from is an exclusive provider network. And we came up with this several years ago. It's nothing new. But say a Grady, and this is perfectly appropriate because Grady actually has proposed this. Uh, as did Memorial Hospital in Savannah. They said, we will put together, if you say all of our patients, you know, all the patients go to our closed network, all grading facilities, they partnered with about five primary care clinics. They were gonna add in extra mental health services, some social workers, provide a really comprehensive healthcare plan. They were going to do it for this amount of money, the money that's available under this kind of block grant plan. Now think about that. What a great option. And hardly any co-payments or deductibles. And I asked John Halpert, we hoped to have here, but he had to be out of the country, the CEO of Grady. I said, have you ever thought about letting other people buy into that plan? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, if I'm a small business entrepreneur in Atlanta, I'm looking at the prices I have to pay uh, on the ACA, $3,000 a year is, is not bad. And uh, he said, no, actually, haven't thought about that, but we'd be willing to do so, and that would actually help the risk. So that would be one option. You would have, you know, Aetna, Blue Cross, Anthem, we encourage anyone to offer policies, but you would have that fallback plan. So we make sure our hospitals aren't losing money. So this is one example of what we could do if we put smart people together in a room, like the people on our panels, and try to solve these problems in Georgia. We can get rid of uncompensated care. We can provide better primary care. We can provide better access to mental health care. All these problems. So I want to open it up for questions now. And uh, I will start it off with some of our panelists. I'm going to start with, with Brian. Direct primary care, the, the, the concept is you can reduce the number of patients. Mm -hmm. So you can provide more, you know, more, more time with those patients, particularly the ones that are sick. We have a doctor shortage in Georgia, and you addressed this a little bit, but I want you to go back to it. Um, you talk real fast, so you might have missed it. And so the, the, the really the only concern that I've heard, and this we have a bill in Georgia, 28 other states, I believe, have passed direct primary care legislation authorizing it, and it's a very simple two-page bill. Uh, it always passes unanimously, so the Senate uh, took them two years, but the Georgia Senate passed it unanimously. Last year, with the House Insurance Committee passed unanimously, uh, now stuck in rules. So our legislative friends out there in the House, you, it got this year, January through April, to pass that bill, uh, so we can become the 29th state in the country to allow direct primary care. The only concern is, is this going to worsen the doctor shortage? If the doctors we have, some of them might be treating fewer patients. So how do you answer that? Yeah. So uh, so two things, Kelly, and and, and one thing I'm going to put out there because. My pet peeve. Sorry, y'all. Uh, we talk about health care and health insurance, and we use the same words together. We're not. We always need to think about what we're talking about when we're talking about health insurance reform or health care. And we, they, they, they've been melded. So, so let's be very cognizant of going, health care is when you see your doctor, health care is when you get a lab, health care is when you get imaging. That's health care. 
health insurance is all this pay for stuff, right? So, so just two things to separate. So anyway, uh, physician shortage. So, so in physicians, we've been, uh, since I was a medical student, which was a long time ago, uh, we were having a push for primary care. It isn't working. You know, you have too many of me and not enough primary care doctors. Why? It's because a primary care doctor sees 2,500 to 3,000 people. I'll try to slow down. They, they spend seven minutes with a patient. They spend 22% of their time doing administrative work. They spend two hours in front of the computer, one hour looking at the patient. They are not very happy with what they're doing. Why would you decide to go into that if you had other options out there? So there's way too many of me and not enough of them. So how do you fix that? You create big movements in, the, in, the, in, uh, in medical school going, hey, let's go into primary care, let's create a primary care initiative, let's try to find a way to help maybe offset your primary care, I mean, your medical school costs. It's not working. Why? Because they didn't fix the problem. The problem is they've got to fix how primary care doctors work. You've got to make a primary care doctor be able to take care of a few patients. You need to make a primary care doctor feel very valued in their career. You need to make a, family, a primary care doctor feel like they're actually helping people rather than triaging people. You fix that problem by fixing the job, not by trying to beg people to go into it. And you start doing that and, and you start creating a primary care network that's based around physicians being physicians, taking care of people, you're going to draw people into that space. So you change the dynamics of, of medical school and you make primary care what it is. It's supposed to be the foundation of our healthcare system. Right now it's the redheaded stepchild. You know, and so that's one way that you fix that problem. Two, people are getting out of medicine in primary care because why? They're running around seeing 2,500 to 3,000 patients. They're spending 22 minutes, I mean, 20% of their time on the computer. They're not taking care of patients. And so you get a lot of primary care doctors to get back to the back end of their career. And they go, you know what, I'm out. I spent enough time doing this. I've, I've done okay in this. And I'm just not going to spend the extra kind of back end of my career continuing to deal with the bureaucracy that's coming down the pipeline on me. I'm out. And that's a really good segment of our population of physicians that we're losing. They know what they're doing. They've been doing this game a while. They need to be teaching the next generation. They don't need to be retiring early. You know, so you do a couple of those things. You fix the disease. Don't just beg people to go ahead and jump into a cesspool that is primary killer. Fix the problem, you know, and then you'll actually find that you extend it to the back end of guys' careers and get more people coming in. Quick follow-up question. Hey, you're a physician, so I might be putting you on the spot, okay. but don't you think that our mid-level providers could be doing a little bit more with physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners, all these areas where we, we do a good job of training them in Georgia, that they're a lot less expensive than a doctor, to, can they not practice to the top of their training? I'm right, right? No, not saying doubt. they should have to do surgery. No, without a doubt. No, I, I completely agree. My, my uh, older brother's a nurse practitioner. He'll tell you, I know where my lines are and where my lines aren't. I don't want to cross those lines. You know, but that being said, within medicine, right, we talk about a couple of different aspects of what medicine is. We have precision medicine. You walk into the office with a bladder infection, guess what? It's not really much of a rocket scientist to figure out what's going on. You know, you don't necessarily need to spend that time in front of your primary care physician. That's not intuitive medicine. Intuitive medicine is somebody comes in with a swollen neck and a fever and night sweats and really not sure what's going on. But that might require a little bit of a level of higher training in order to kind of parse that. And if you can actually have, again, smaller practice with a nurse practitioner covering some more patients, a physician working intimately together, a healthcare community of pharmacists working together, you know, now you've created a true patient-centered medical home that, again, extends the ability of each of those people to work to the maximal capacity of their abilities. Studies show primary care doctors right now work to 30% of their capacity. They're too busy doing too many other things to actually maximize their utility in, in our society. So, so yes, you can extend that by bringing additional people on board, uh, you know, and, and that's a, I think that's something that's gonna be necessary. So Russ, in the last 24 hours, we've had some, we've alluded to it, we've had a couple of announcements uh, from Washington. One is selling insurance across state lines. Of course, Georgia has a law um, that allows that. I think two states have that. Um, hadn't really taken it up. It's something we think is a good idea. We don't think it's gonna, it, you know, it's this huge magic bullet. It's an incremental reform. And association health plans, which have been around for a while. So does this mean problem solved, we don't need to do anything? Or what I'm thinking is, you know, maybe some interesting lifelines for some people until we can get our waivers taken care of. Yeah. Um, well, association health plans have been around a long time. Um, what you find in most subsets of the general population is that for a period of time the people that enroll in those systems are healthier than the average population 
and the costs are low and the premiums are relatively low. But over time, people get ill. Um, they're still part of the group. As premiums get back to normal because of the increase in costs, um, people tend to not join, additional people don't tend not to join that group. And then it sort of rolls down the hill, so to speak. Um, if you had a large group of people that were continually being renewed, more people joining them, uh, that might work. It's, it's, they're very limited situations and when it's wor where it's worked in the past. I'm not saying it can, I'm just saying it takes uh, a lot more than it sounds like to get it to work. Um, same way with across state lines. Um, I've had a number of my clients ask me about, you know, how about if I can buy insurance across state lines? I understand coverage in Iowa is a lot cheaper than, than coverage in Georgia. Why couldn't I buy a policy from Iowa to cover my problems in Georgia? I said, it's no problem as long as you want to go to the doctor in Iowa. Um, that's, the way the, that's the way the reimbursement system is structured right now. Now, if you work for one of these companies that were up here, they probably wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, and, and that's where things are going to happen, I think, more than in the, the, what I would call the huge picture. You're going to see more change on a local basis with things like you're talking about coming from the bottom up, um, people getting together to solve their problems. You know, I'm going to have, in two weeks when open enrollment opens, a lot of people at my door wanting to know what they can do because they can't pay $35,000 a year. In fact, $35,000 a year may be what they're paid. Um, they've got children that they want to take care of. They've got families they want to take care of. It's not easy. Um, so I think local things are going to, to, to be a big way to fix things. Things like a direct primary care practice. I'll give you an example. About two months ago, Friday night, I had a toothache. Saturday, I had an abscess tooth. Saturday's not a good time to get an abscess tooth. I knew I wasn't going to get into a dentist to fix it. I called my primary care doctor on his cell phone because he gave me his cell number a long time ago. I told him what was up. He said, I'll call it. This was Sunday morning when I called him, when it had really gotten bad. Um, he said, I'll, call, I'll text the pharmacist what you need, and he'll call you when he can meet you. I got a text in about 15 minutes saying, I'm in church. I'll meet you at the office. I'll meet you at the store in 10 minutes after 12. 10 minutes after 12, I had a prescription. I didn't have to see the doctor. I didn't have to see the pharmacist. Um, that's the kind, that's the way medicine should work for everybody. Um, it's, it's hard if you've got three or 4,000 patients. I've talked to several direct primary care doctors on the phone that say they've got more like 1,500 patients, maybe 2,000. Um, they are actually seeing six to seven people a day, not what you normally do. I went to get my physical about three weeks ago and I sat in, in the front room for over an hour. Um, then I went back in the back room and sat for another 20 minutes before the doctor got there and he was there for 10 minutes. Um, with a medical student, by the way, who didn't seem interested in practicing in a small town like ours. Although I talked to her about that while the doctor wasn't there. Um, the, um, because you've always got to, look, if you live where I do, you've always got to look for doctors that want to come work there. Um, so I don't know, I, I think in the big picture we should work toward things like that, but I think you're going to see more of the solutions coming from the bottom up than the top down, at least solutions that work. Well, that's a great example because there's a story a while ago, back in 2008, there was an individual called DeMonte Driver, 12-year-old boy uh, in Baltimore, I believe, that had an abscess tooth. 
And because he was on Medicaid, his mother could not find a dentist that would take him. Three weeks later, later, somehow the infection reached his brain. He had to have emergency brain surgery and died two weeks later. And you call up on a cell phone in your meeting that day. I and mean, that shows you what access to care it can be a life and death situation. So before we go to the audience, Ray, what can the states expect money-wise to get, you know, what's on the table um, for, for these 1332 waivers? And most importantly, our legislators are thinking, how much money are the states going to have to put up? Can we do it without anything? The federal bills, Graham Cassidy and BCRA, there was no state money involved. And it's, it, even if it's a small amount, small amount of a big number is a, is a big number, and that's money that you're not spending on education or the big pension number we've got to put in this year, or you've got to raise taxes. Um, you know, so states, that puts them in a difficult situation. If it's federal money, that's a whole different ballgame, much easier. Yeah, so, uh, if, so states are approaching it two different ways. So some states are basically doing it all through federal funds that are already going through a state. And so when Alaska did the reinsurance waiver, they were taking the advanced premium tax credits, the APTCs, and the cost sharing uh, reductions. And then they did a, a overall state tax and insurers used that to pay for a little bit of the reinsurance fund. Uh, Iowa, on the other hand, said, we're not going to tax ourselves, we're only going to use federal dollars. And you know, you're looking at uh, billions of dollars you know, that could be going to the states and then basically reallocated to different people. And then uh, I was also, again, kind of pushing the envelope because what they're saying is don't just look at the money coming in today. Look at how much more money that would be coming in if we don't slow these premium increases, right? So they're saying because the federal government's on the hook uh, 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 for premium subsidies is based on the value of the premiums. If our premiums keep going up 30, 40 percent, federal government's going to be paying a lot more money. And then you're taking a look at other uh, states that are considering, is it only money going to people who are actually enrolled in the individual market eligible for sub subsidies? Or there's arguments to be made that everybody in the state who could potentially be receiving that premium subsidy could be there. So states are being very aggressive and inventive uh, uh, in seeking these sources for dollars. Um, I think you know what I'd like to see again is uh, for states to be able to combine Medicaid money and uh, some of these advanced premium tax credit subsidies and being able to actually consolidate under family-based plans because we know a lot of problems is uh, a children may be on CHIP, you know, the Children's Health Insurance Program, a parent may be on Medicaid, and then, you know, maybe somebody else in the family member is getting a subsidy for insurance. So states could have the ability to combine it, access to all that uh, single source funding and then do a family-based kind of health care plan for those people. So that's what you're looking at. States are experimenting based on what they want to happen. And uh, uh, you know, those are states with good reforms. And you know, on the other hand, you have you know, Vermont who wanted to pursue uh, a federal funds for a single payer system. So I mean, uh, states are being very inventive and creative. And let me just echo what y'all are talking about the bottom up, because I see it as a race between innovation at the local level to figure out better ways to offer care uh, outracing kind of top-down control from the federal government that doesn't want to allow uh, a DPC to be able to serve a lot of people, you know. Uh, uh, and so I'm optimistic that this administration will start to continue to encourage DPC paid for through Medicaid, a 1332 type program where people that are receiving federal funds, those can be used to pay for some of these arrangements. So it's a big race, and I hope that you guys win. Getting back to the flexibility, I forgot, I mentioned Memorial um, down in Savannah, along with the Grady Plan. <coughs> Their plan was obviously different. They partnered with several counties and rural hospitals in the surrounding area around Savannah and submitted the same type of network because they realized that you know, in you know, Richmond County, they don't have all the resources to offer a comprehensive plan that would meet the muster of the, the 11 uh, of these um, 1332 waivers. And so they worked with Memorial to provide that comprehensive plan. So it shows you that there are different parts to say on come up with unique ideas. All right, let's raise the lights. I'm sure we've got some good questions out there. Raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Kelly, could I mention Go, something right ahead. quick? While we're, while we're microphones are going to speak. So we talked a little bit about high-risk pools and our work on them. Everybody seemed to think high-risk pools were these things that got really expensive and blew up and didn't do things well. I just One, two, three, four. It's a book from 2009. 
This is a comprehensive report of all the high-risk pools that were operating in the country at that time. There were 36 states that had high-risk pools, most of them working very well. As I said earlier, maybe 30, 32 of them. Um, while current law may not allow those kinds of high-risk pools, there are ways to provide sort of hybrid high-risk pools that would take some of the very large claims off of the insurance company's back, put it into a general fund kind of thing, mm -hmm. so that the insurance companies wouldn't be impacted by the few claims that get really big, but would still be paying most of the claims that are under, there, there's a place in a claims continuum where you go from having 1,500 or 2,000 claims at that level to having four. So basically you put the high risk pool bottom at that place and then you're just paying those four or eight or 10 claims and a smaller group, maybe 100 or 200 or 300 and a state above that rate to keep those, those huge claims, millions of dollars, from going back into the premium pool where people have to pay for those. So, anyway. All right, questions? I want to write. Thank you. Uh, State Representative Scott Turner. And I want to explore a little bit uh, with Mr. Hederman. He mentioned with 1332 waivers that there are four guardrails. And in my notes here, it says basically the state would have to provide the same Obamacare benefits. Uh, the, the state would have to offer the same Obamacare cost sharing. Uh, we would have to cover the same number of, of people that would be enrolled in Obamacare. And the fourth one, which is kind of the, the ringer, right? Uh, basically, we can't add to the national debt. So the federal government, the U.S. Constitution, doesn't have a balanced budget amendment currently. Here in Georgia, we do. Uh, that fourth one seems to me like it would be putting Georgia on the hook for any cost overruns that might be experienced by the program. So in effect, we are, we would be un, uh, unknowingly participating in taking on additional costs that we see skyrocketing in the, in the way of, of premiums every single year uh, without actually addressing the problem of why those premiums continue to go up. So as a state lawmaker, why in the world would I ever want Georgia who has the restriction of a balanced budget to participate in a 1332 waiver when we would be on the hook for any cost overruns? So, um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's the same restriction, basically, it's kind of like a, a Medicaid 1115, right, where if the state is on the hook for overall costs, what was unique about this is the Obama administration said it couldn't be over a five-year period. So what you're seeing is states are saying, let's take a look, and how I was doing it is the tax credit that would be available for their people would only be based on transfers from the federal government, the dollars that are available. So Iowa actually is put in their proposal that I would not be on the hook for it. Instead, you could see a sliding credit based on the amount of money from the federal government. So Iowa built in that safeguard to protect Iowa taxpayers from being on the hook. The second thing is that you could take a look and say, look, you know, if we're doing a flat tax credit, then you have a pretty good idea of what the cost would be. And then you can go back to the federal government and say, look, you know, if more people come enrolled, you can make an argument then saying these people would have been getting higher premiums or higher subsidy assistance from the federal government to make that available. So the states that are pursuing this are taking that into consideration and saying, look, we're only going to do, go forward with this if we have this guaranteed pull of money from the federal government so states are not on the hook, because that is a very, very valid point. Um, I think one of the bigger, you know, one of the big questions I hear a lot is that, you know, the, it, it, you know, the same type of coverage from the Affordable Care Act. So how is that defined by the administration? It could be very different from how the Obama administration interpreted it. So it could be basically based on the actuarial value of the benefits, like are you providing a comparable level of, say, 70 percent, something along those lines. Or, you know, it could be uh, slightly worse, basically saying we want to have more uh, drug coverage, we want to have more maternity care. So again, let states do it. Um, that's why I said that uh, uh, 1332 is not a silver bullet because you still have that guardrail, which is why some of the federal discussions were being able to create kind of a super waiver for states. But I think, you know, to answer your point, if you take a look at how Iowa basically has gamed it out and written it, 
they've crafted their waiver that you wouldn't have that open-ended exposure to put Georgia taxpayers on the hook. I'll answer that one more, if you don't mind, Kelly. So, so the problem that we have with our thought, right, is that we see things the way they are. It's always hard to see things a little differently. So what we're saying is we're going to take this money from the federal government, no matter how, or however we're paying for health care, and we're going to give it to the same health care system that's high cost, low quality, inaccessible, you know, every touch along the way. The solution is fixing the cost of health care, right? That's the thing we've got to fix. So if we say, how do we fix health care? We create innovative health care delivery models that are low cost, high touch, high quality, allow those patients to access a primary care doctor on a regular routine basis, allow them to reach their primary care doctor with a cell phone on Saturday instead of having to go to the ER, and, or perhaps, God forbid, they get a you know, brain abscess and they end up having to be in the emergency room or operating room and die. Find a way to fix the health care problem of accessing health care, and, and you do that by creating a better health care delivery model. And so direct pay care, direct primary care, you know, does that in accessing a lower cost, high quality health care system. And if you can create, so we're ecosystem change is what we are. I'm not just DPC. We have direct based contracting for every touch in the outpatient space of healthcare labs, imaging, pharmaceutical, ambulatory surgery, st surgical consultations, specialty consultations. Fix the healthcare delivery system itself from the medicine side. And then guess what? The purchasing power of those dollars go a heck of a lot further. It's both that have to happen. You can't get stuck on just this is how it is. And then we're, all we're doing is just you know, paying for what it, the way things are. That, that's where we solve the problem. That's where Georgia leads right, the rest of the states. That's how Georgia takes care of its citizenry. That's how Georgia makes its people healthier to become a better workforce. You know, that's how Georgia wins. And you've seen some experimentation. I was saying there was a, uh, um, uh, you're starting to see some states experimenting with Medicaid paying for direct primary mm -hmm. care with the idea that, you know, dollars the state is spending. I mean, I don't know about Georgia, but, you know, in Ohio, because we expanded Medicaid, it's a huge problem crowding out our other priorities. So again, the idea is, tax dollars go further using a direct primary care system where it's cheaper for the state and cheaper for the taxpayers, and more importantly, sometimes the patient gets better care. Not all, I mean, not all, all yeah. always get better care in the DPC. I tell people that Medicaid is the pride of the healthcare industry, right? I mean, most, this, you can have Medicaid in your pocket, but not a whole lot of physicians take Medicaid. It doesn't do you a whole heck of a lot of good if a doc doesn't take care of you. And then if you're one of 3,000 people that your doctor's trying to run around and take care of, you're not gonna get that great care. Do both, Perfect. drop the price of care and make better care. Perfect example, our AVD population in Medicaid, which is the sickest group, disabled individuals, it's still fee for service. So they're exactly, those are the ones that are having a hard time finding a doctor. And you know, direct primary care would be a, a great solution for them. Question over here. Uh, Kelly, Sharon Cooper, Representative Sharon Cooper, Chair of the Health Committee, and a former nursing professor. So I, I tell you that because I wanted to say I know what I'm talking about. First of all, when you're talking, and it's mainly to you, and it goes to our whole problem in the healthcare system, when you're talking about the mid levels. Well, the mid levels, the nurse practitioner and the PAs, are not in the areas where we need them, just like physicians. We are a rural state, they are not in the rural areas. We have a workplace place, I have a map on the back of my office door, and it shows where the physicians are, where the PAs are, and where the nurse practitioners are. They're not in rural areas. They'll tell you they want to go out and treat this population, but they're not there. And it's the same reason there's not physicians in many ways. They can't make a living. They have a spouse that needs to work, and that spouse can't find a job in Osceola, Georgia. So we have that problem. So, you know, how do we solve that? The other problem is I want you to tell me when we I hear all the time, we should let our mid-levels practice to their full ability. Well, what is that? The only thing our nurse practitioners can't do now is work independently in our PAs, and they don't give Schedule IIs opioids. Would you have them give opioids in the middle of a terrible crisis? And the nurse practitioners can't order the really, really, really expensive uh, x-rays like CT scans and things. They can do it if it's life-threatening. And, and there's reasons for those. So what do they want to do? What are you saying is to the fullest of their ability? And the other thing is, they're not coming out of school trained well. And so like Dr. Hill said, if they had like an internship of a year or so to go out and work more independently, if they were in the areas, but the nurse practitioners, not the PAs, the nurse practitioners come down to the Capitol and say they are better 
than physicians. You know, there's something about knowing who you are. I mean, these are major problems that we face, and yet we have, you know, the programs that are being offered more and more in nursing school, it's online experience and less clinical experience. And your hospital administrators of nursing will tell you that we are turning out nurses in this state that cannot function independently on a med search floor. So I, I think when you start talking about using extenders more, you also need to bring up the problems that they're having and look at it realistically. And I don't know where there's a question in that, but it's really a problem that I have in being tired of listening, people talking about using mid-levels and they don't know the whole scope of the problem. Sorry. Uh, here, I'll do a quick question. I want to ask Sharon's question. Can I answer, can I answer Sharon's, question? Sharon's, question? Sharon's question? And that's awesome, Sharon. Um, so I, I, I'm a, I'm, I, I think it's time for us to come together as a healthcare system and, and, and physicians and nurse practitioners and stop fighting over silliness, right? We're, our job is to take care of people. And, and so when we see, so in our, our, our offices and how we have our offices set up, we actually limit our patient panels to 700 patients that our primary care doctor takes care of. If we bring a nurse practitioner on, we extend it to about 1,100 to 1,200. An average physician practices 3,000 people with a nurse practitioner carrying probably another 1,500 patients on top of that. We create a relationship between the physician and the patient and the, and the nurse practitioner. It's a team. It's a team working together. We have a health and wellness coach in the office. It's a team. It's everybody focusing on taking care of the person in front of you. It's not going, hey, I've got to fight for my NP to get my NP to be able to write this prescription. Or, and, and the reason that's so much in today's healthcare system is everybody's so distracted. We're too busy looking at insurance and all the regulations and the worries instead of going, hey, we can get rid of all that stuff and focus on the patient and spend our resources there as a team. And so I don't worry too much about, and I don't quite so down at the Capitol too much about, you know, the, the, the trying to limit a patient's or people's ability to go, hey, I can write this, I can write that. I go, let's just create a team that actually focus around the individual and the patient and create a patient-centered medical home around a limited patient panel focused on them. And as far as the community and getting out into the, the rural communities, right, huge problem out there. Big problem from the physician side, they'll tell you, is payer mix. Right? I'm not going to go out into a place where I have a terrible payer mix. My payer mix goes away when you create a membership-based model for primary care. I have a fixed payment model that we, that we do. We actually match our you know, product of primary care. We can do it with the business. You can actually, we have a, a mark, you know, an insurance that doesn't mess with us, but actually is a lower cost insurance product you know, that allows us to go into the, the marketplace of a, of a rural community and say, hey, this is what our primary care doctors, we know it's a fixed payment model, we know what our physicians are going to get paid, and we can actually pay our primary care doctors pretty well because we just popped the bubble of all the excess costs in healthcare that are administrative. You know, I get rid of those 10 administrators that stood up, there's a lot of excess capital that's available to be spent on, on actually taking care of people. So we've got to pop the bubble. That fixes the problem. I opened a little can of worms there, didn't I? Um, Russ, real well, quickly. One of the things, one of the things that um, would help a lot uh, there are several programs in Georgia that encourage physicians to practice in rural areas. I'm from a rural area, so I'm, I'm right on board on this. But there are several programs that in, in, encourage doctors to practice in rural areas. They pay their medical school bills. They do things like that. There are not any programs for PAs. There are not any programs for nurse practitioners. Uh, we need to expand those programs to PAs and nurse practitioners so that they get exposed to rural areas so they know we're not all that bad. Um, and, and they can come treat us, we'll be nice to them, you know. Yeah. Senator? I was afraid to follow Sharon. Uh, <laughs> I have a couple of questions. First one is, when we talk about the individual market, that's what we're talking about here, not the group market, so everybody's on the same page. How many people are we talking about in Georgia, number one, Number two, we talk about the individual market, and I like the idea of direct primary care. There's only one problem. In the individual market, I don't know if you can buy catastrophe coverage above that. Yes, and that's a problem there, too. And the third we point is this. It gets back to what the doctor said. We're not talking about the cost, folks. When, I go, when people go in to see the doctor today, they run all these additional tests because of defensive medicine. We're not talking about tort reform here, okay? Well, they're not talking about it in Washington because of the lobbyists. Let's talk about getting to the root cause here. Because, you know, all we're doing here is taking money and still paying the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. That's all we're doing here. That doesn't answer the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. The problem is cost. They're out of sight. They're unbelievable. People can't afford it. When he's talking $3,000 a month, are you kidding me? It's more than these people's mortgages. I mean, we've got a crisis here. 
And, you know, I like the ideas you have, Kelly, and all that, but we also got to deal with the cost here, and we can't lose sight of that. Because last time I checked, my friends in the insurance industry, of which I was a part for 40 years, they got pretty good, healthy balance sheets. Yes. Well, I would echo, and we're out of time, time right? <laughs> one, one quick response, right? Yeah, you, 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 uh, I would agree. Let me, let me, one small defense of insurance companies mostly is that because they are now being mandated to cover, and they can no longer do any type of risk analysis. So you take a look at a lot of these regulations, and there's some great work uh, come out of my colleague saying, when you mandate all these benefits, right, like I hear a lot about, you know, the free birth control that came up, that comes out of higher premiums, and that's why these prices are so unaffordable. So being able, anything we can do, resting down what government is requiring insurers to offer, that's going to help driving down premiums. Sorry. The third of the tests that have to be taken by Oh, yeah, it fits. Yep. Let medicine be medicine. Yep. Uh, so yep. Guys, let medicine be medicine. We'll drive down the cost of care. Let insurance be the way you pay for health care, right? One thing we learned about cost, I think one primary care investing in that is one, let's make sure employers are at the table. Let's, let's get our data and analyze so we know what we're doing and we know if it's going to work. Thank you all very much. Thank you to our panel. And uh, we'll be back in about 10 minutes to get a set for lunch.